You can start, Suganda. The live stream is on. Uh, I'm waiting for the queue for Shubhidi. It takes four minutes. The live streaming is on. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, Suganda, you can go ahead. Okay. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It gives me immense pleasure to welcome you all for the 15th AICCS All India Conference of China Studies, organized by Institute of Chinese Studies, New Delhi, and Indian Institute of Technology, Guwahati. We are also in uh, partnership with the Guwahati University and Omiyo Kumar Institute of Social Change and Development, and in cooperation with India uh, Office, Conrad Adenauer Stiffing. The special theme of the conference this year is Connected Geographies and Cultural Interfaces. Over the next three days, we will be having around about 35 presentations on a wide range of themes by senior scholars as well as young researchers through 12 sessions, including the inaugural and the valedictory. Uh, before we would begin, uh, I would like to remind you of a few housekeeping rules. Please be muted throughout the session. Uh, since this is an inaugural session with the keynote address by Professor Dwara, we shall conduct a Q&A session subject to the availability of time. Uh, only, when, only then we will permit everyone to unmute themselves and ask the questions. Uh, you can use the raised hand option in the end or you can post the questions in the chat box throughout the presentation. Uh, we shall now begin with the inaugural session with welcome remarks from Professor Alkacharya, our Honorary Director of Institute of Chinese Studies, New Delhi, and Professor, Cent uh, in Prof uh, Professor in Center for East Asian Studies, School of International Studies, Jawaharlal Nehru University, Delhi. Over to you, ma'am. Thank you, Suganda, and uh, um, very, very warm welcome and greetings to one and all. Um, on this most special and precious occasion in the ICS calendar, the All India Conference of China Studies. This is the 15th chapter of our flagship conference. And um, I have little hesitation in saying that this has easily become one of the most well-known and prestigious platforms for the research scholars of China in India. And it has another unique aspect that it brings together the entire community from the senior most scholars to the budding enthusiasts to engage and contend and contest. More than a decade and a half ago, the AICCS was conceptualized as a platform to promote the scholarly study of China and expand at that time a very small group across universities in India. And the AICCS was uh, would, would constitute a kind of a grid or a network which would encourage, enlarge and enrich this community, provide inputs, both material and intellectual to promote, connect and enrich. This would also be an occasion to take stock of where we were yeah. as a source community. No, um, I, uh, Yes, uh, so this is also an occasion to take stock of where uh, we are uh, as a discourse community um, in terms of our uh, research and uh, output. And therefore it has been a longstanding practice. It's a kind of a self-reflexive practice to periodically review the state of China studies in India. Um, the strengths, its inadequacies, assess the distance ground covered by this community. Uh, the convener and co-conveners would uh, take you through the special theme of this conference this year, and I will therefore leave it to them. Um, for now, I will once again wish you a very, very warm welcome and uh, uh, look forward to taking you through uh, this great feast that we have uh, set up over the next three days. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, ma'am. Uh, let me now invite Mr. Adrian Hark, Director, Conrad Adenauer Stiffung, New Delhi. Thank you very much. Honorable guests, ladies and gentlemen, I'm delighted to welcome you officially to the 15A AICCS on the special theme of connected geographies and cultural interfaces. First of all, I would like to thank
Hello, Director Adrian. Was uh, a reason uh, for. Hello. Wars between this. Uh, sir, you're frozen and we can't hear you. We can see you now. Uh, would you like to try your okay. mic? Am I, am I audible? Yes, yes. Okay, let's try again. <laughs> yes. So, ladies and gentlemen, my, my family comes from an area in Germany which was always an issue between France and Germany. It was always the reason for war between these two countries, not the main reason, but one out of a few. And before the Second World War, this region was part of Germany. In 1945, it was uh, occupied by France. And in 1955, there was a voting under the responsibility of United Nations. And in this voting, the, the people could decide if they want to be part of France or Germany. They voted in favor of Germany. France actually accepted uh, this democratic voting, while Germany was guaranteeing numerous rights to the French-speaking minority. And today, it is a bilingual area It seems we have lost him again. Uh, Director Adrian, we can request you to go ahead without the video. So if they issue the bandwidth, then we can at least Stop share. the video, yeah. I think he's, I think he's still facing the same issue. Uh, Suganda, you can give him a cue uh, about the glitch. Uh, so we are still facing the same issue. Uh, we would suggest you to switch off your video and uh, continue with the audio. Uh, I think he has dropped out of the meeting room. So I'll come on. I think we should move on to the next speaker while we wait for him to join. Uh, Suganda, please, please yes. go ahead. Uh, okay. So I would now invite Professor Dr. T.G. Sitaram, Director of Indian Institute of Technology, Guwahati. So you're on mute. I, no, he has, he has locked it. Okay, all right. <clears throat> Namaskar. Very good morning to all of you. It's indeed a very great pleasure to be here for the 15th AICCS conference jointly held by the Indian Institute of Technology, Gauhati, and Institute of China Studies, New Delhi, in partnership with Conrad. I don't know, Stefan, and in cooperation with Guwahati University and Omiyo Kumar Das Institute of Social Change and Development. I welcome all the distinguished uh, speakers from India and abroad to this event. I could see a large number of participants are online and a very excellent program has been scheduled for all the three days. So ladies and gentlemen, 
the connected geographies and cultural interfaces is a very critical aspect which is the special theme of this year's conference and it is timely it's very timely and particularly between india and china so as we know the two nations with the largest populations and also having a long history of diplomatic relationships between these two countries india became the first non socialistic bloc country to establish diplomatic relations with the people's republic of china way back in april 1950 if we go deeper in history we are aware that the oldest civilizations both shared their cultural traits and had commercial as well as technological exchanges since the beginning of the human history yet the ties between the two countries are inadequate we are seeing the flash points many time at our borders so we all know that the conflict and crisis marred the relations between the two rising powers in asia in the 21st century despite internal and external geopolitical challenges both have economically developed individually both have strategically made a mark in the global architecture might china might have been maybe advanced at least another 30 years ahead of india in 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 the developmental that is infrastructure development and other areas therefore one must acknowledge that there is huge scope for learning from each other and also huge scope huge scope for broad based cooperation between india and china beyond the state and bilateral ties that means basically people to people contact and this is where i think uh, institute of china studies and uh, other institutes who have assembled together to do that mark i would have been happier if we had some more speakers from chinese side in this event as well but uh, anyway then nevertheless we need to develop new dialogues partnerships which have begun through the many academic programs between the institutes so iit guwahati has a excellent collaboration uh with uh, chinese universities and also some of our uh, even alumni are working in uh, republic of china and uh, recently you know one of the uh, alumni who we acknowledge that its contribution between uh, developing relation between india and china a civil engineer in uh, uh, iit guwahati uh, we have recognized him as a best alumni award uh, about a year back what is however missing is consistent interaction of scholars and academics in the particularly in the northeast which is having a sharing a large boundary between uh, republic of china and india and we know that there is a profound knowledge uh, with both the countries and uh, both at the nationally as well as uh, subnationally and also at the societal level we need to do now interact more and more with multidisciplinary perspective this joint initiative of iit guwahati ics and other institutes in the northeast therefore allows us to open avenues for research and collaboration in new areas of china studies ranging from language to politics economy strategic studies art and films and in addition to that basically research and development is the which is the focus of iit guwahati we would love to also have more interaction with uh, chinese universities and chinese scholars i would like to mention indian institute of technology guwahati in the in the last 2 3 years have been ranking internationally excellently well particularly in the qs world ranking 2022 2023 i just like to mention one of the quantifiable parameter which is research citations per faculty we are number 2 in the country number 37 in the world the unpar with stanford berkeley in that which is a great you know achievement of our faculty and research scholars at iit guwahati so that gives us a lot of uh, you know feather so that we can really be a link institute between the chinese universities and indian universities in the northeast iit guwahati being the only iit indian institute of technology in the northeast uh, covering all the eight states so we have a better scope for interaction with these uh, institutes in china in addition to that i would like to say today indian institute of technology which uh, 
basically started in 1960s as an elite engineering institutions have been transformed themselves into a multidisciplinary research universities. Today we have schools of business, school of health science and technology, and school of energy science and technology, and humanities in a big group, science, basic science department like physics, chemistry, mathematics, biology, and then engineering departments, all of this makes a truly interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary university. And uh, in fact, we have close to about 8,100 students on campus with 450 faculty, more than 100 faculty internationally as a visiting and honorary professors. So with this, uh, you know, IIT Guwahati is actually leading in the innovations and entrepreneurial activities in the Northeast. Our entrepreneurial activities is also very big. We have transferred, you know, we have actually set up more than 65 startup companies in the last two years. And our faculty has uh, put more than 200 patents in the last two years. And uh, similarly, you know, we have transferred more than 25 technologies to the industry. In our IIT Guwahati research part, we have co-located more than 25 companies within the campus. So particularly, I'm very happy to tell you Assam government and IIT Guwahati has joined hands to start a medical school and also build a 350-bedded postgraduate teaching hospital in the campus, in the campus. So we have already formed a Section 8 company between government of Assam and IIT Guwahati with complete funding of about 575 crores from government of Assam to IIT Guwahati cabinet of uh, government of Assam has cleared that. So with these accomplishments, I think we can attract many universities, uh, very well doing universities in, uh, in the North, uh, in, in China to come to us and talk to us and understand from each other. Even in humanities also, we have started a liberal arts program, masters in liberal arts. We have a masters in uh, development studies. And we are also looking at an undergraduate program in uh, liberal arts at IIT Guwahati. So this, uh, with this brief introduction about IIT, I would like to say IIT Guwahati recognizes the importance of these fields of interest uh, for the collaboration with the Chinese universities and research scholars. In addition, I also need to emphasize that there are ample opportunities to collaborate and expand the scope of research domains to a wider range of subjects that focuses on science and technology as well. We would welcome any such move and we value institutionalizing the collaboration into long-term partnerships among faculty and researchers working on China studies. As some of you would know, IIT Guwahati has established an academic and research collaborations apart from student and faculty exchange program with nearly five universities in China. We look forward to extending these partnerships and also welcome ICS to join in some of these initiatives depending on the interest. At the same time, we would encourage new dialogues in emerging trends of research among other institutions as well. We also invite the Chinese scholars to visit us, you know, and stay in our campus so that, you know, more interaction and learning can happen, which could reduce the tension at the border. With these few words, I congratulate the organizers and particularly from IIT Guwahati, Professor Pahi Saikya. And I also welcome all of you once again, and I hope you all have a rewarding experience for the next three days. Thank you. Jai Hind. Namaskar. Uh, thank you so much, sir. We would like to go back to Mr. Adrian Hark, the director, Conrad Adjenior Stiffing, New York. Uh, sorry, New Delhi. I'm so sorry. Uh, sir, can you please test your mic? So am I audible? Yes. Yeah. But you are right, there's also a Konrad Adenauer Foundation office in New York. Okay. But uh, I'm yeah. very happy to be here in New Delhi. Should I start from the beginning or in the middle where I was frozen? So I would suggest from the beginning. Perfect. Honorable guests, ladies and gentlemen, I'm delighted to welcome you officially to the 15th AICCS on the special theme of connected geographies and cultural interfaces. First of all, I would like to thank the Institute of Chinese Studies and the Indian Institute of Technology, Guwahati, for organizing this event. 
Thank you, dear Madam Professor Alka Sharara. Ladies and gentlemen, my family comes uh, from a region in Germany, which was always an issue between France and Germany. It was often in history the reason for war, not the main reason, but one out of a few. And before the Second World War, it was part of Germany. And after the Second World War, it was occupied by France. And in 1955, so 10 years after the war, there was a voting under the responsibility of the United Nations. And before this election, both sides agreed that they will stick to the voting. The people voted in favor of Germany. France accepted the democratic voting, while Germany at the same time was guaranteeing numerous rights to the French speaking minority. Today, it is a bilingual region, which has due to the European Union open borders and thousands of people cross the border every day in both directions. They go to work on the other side, they go for shopping, they study, or they just visit friends. And this is a very positive example of a border region, but all over the world, as we right now see in Donbass, there are also a lot of negative examples. But uh, I'm sharing these examples to show that uh, there's always the, the chance to turn into positive. Because the region of Saarland uh, was, uh, uh, was, an, uh, was actually suffering from its, its place at the border region for many centuries and is now very prosperous, very booming and a very lovely place due to the fact that they turned their location into a positive. And ladies and gentlemen, the expansionism of China in the, at the Himalaya border of India is a threat. And it has the potential to create a bigger conflict. And China's expansionism is an issue, and I have to admit that as a German, as a European, it is an issue which is under the radar of the European public. Thus today, conference holds an opportune moment to gauge its wider scope and enlighten us with a broader understanding of this particular region. So on behalf of Konrad Adenauer Stiftung, I would like to express my gratitude to our organizers, our panelists, uh, our distinguished scholars, and all guests of today. I'm looking forward to a fruitful discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, let me now invite Professor Sabri Mitra, convener of 15th AICCS, Professor of Center of Chinese and Southeast Asian Studies in Jawaharlal Nehru University, New Delhi, and Honorary Fellow of Institute of Chinese Studies, New Delhi, for the convener's remarks. Over to you, ma'am. Thank you, Suvendra. Good morning. Professor P.G. Sitaram, Director IIT Guwahati, Professor Prasanti Dwara, eminent historian and keynote speaker of the conference, who needs no introduction, actually. Mr. Adrian Hart, Director Conrad Adenauer Stiftung, New Delhi, Professor Alka Acharya, Honorary Director, ICS, Professor Sukanya Sharma, Head of the Department of Humanities and Social Sciences, IIT Guwahati, Dr. Pahi Saikya, co convener of the 15th AICCS, colleagues from academic institutions of India and abroad, young scholar participants, ladies and gentlemen. Greetings from Team AICCS. As has been mentioned, All India Conference of China Studies, AICCS in short, is the flagship event of Institute of Chinese Studies held each year in collaboration with universities and institutions across India. The objective is to generate interest and strengthen research in China studies. We have come a long way since the Institute had undertaken the first exercise of reviewing the state of China studies in India in 2006. Over time, this exercise has become institutionalized into an annual conference that showcases enduring and emerging themes 
<clears throat> in China studies, encourages interdisciplinarity, provides a platform for young scholars and promotes active networking in these uh, uh, through, through this through time. In these years, the AICCS has traveled literally the length and breadth of India, collaborating with central and state universities such as Vishwabharati, Central University of Hyderabad, Banaras Hindu University, uh, and uh, Mumbai University, Goa University, private universities such as Christ, Christ University, OP Jindal Global University, institutions such as IIM Kozikot and IIT Chennai. <clears throat> Most of these collaborations actually have gone beyond AICCS, maturing into other initiatives and projects. This year, the 15th AICCS is an academic collaboration with Indian Institute of Technology, Guwahati, Guwahati University, and Omiya Kumar Das Institute of Social Change and Development. As in previous years, we have also received valuable support from Conrad Adenauer Stiftung, which we hope will continue in the coming years too. It is significant that the 15th AICCS is a result of academic cooperation between the ICS and three institutions of eminence located in Guwahati, gateway to the northeastern part of India, regarded by scholars as a strategic link between South, Southeast and East Asia, sharing common geographical features and development objectives. <clears throat> From the ancient period, interaction in this region has had the civilizational framework at its foundation. Part of the once thriving Southern Silk Route, this region is often conceptualized as a cultural region, characterized by ethnic affinities and historical interactions between different communities. Himalayan ecologies, shared level of relative deprivation, and so on. On one hand, the region has witnessed re rich people-to-people -people interactions in the realms of culture from ancient times, and on the other, it represents the aspirations and anxieties of enormous strategic significance as perceived through the lens of contemporary geopolitical considerations. Therefore, the theme of connected geographies and cultural interfaces that reflects all these scholarly con concerns has been chosen as the special theme this year. The keynote address by Professor Prasenji Para, the special lecture by Professor Madhuri Ampi, and the validatory address by Ambassador Nirup Kumar Rao will explore the special theme from multiple vantage points and frameworks, providing a glimpse of the continued complexities and changing dynamics. It is well known that the Mayport movement of 1919 and the establishment of the Communist Party of China in 1921 combined together had deep and decisive impact on the Chinese consciousness in the last century and stimulated a process of comprehensive transformation of the Chinese people. 100 years on, the 20th Congress of the Communist Party of China held last month has attracted enormous attention globally with scholars analyzing if it is another turning point in China's journey, or is it more of the same? And most importantly, what does it mean for the world in general and India in particular? The discussion on 20th Party Congress held, held yesterday as a curtain raiser to the AICCS and the special lecture by Professor Lu Xiangling to be held tomorrow provide different perspectives on the journey of the Chinese party state and its policies and practices. The 15th AICCS has received individual abstracts and panel proposals on a wide range of China-related themes. Some are products of recent scholarship on conventional topics, while others are emerging issues of contemporary and critical relevance with a special reference to the Northeastern states of India and their people. The conference also includes a special panel on state of China studies in India that takes stock of the prospects and challenges as it highlights the inherent strength and weaknesses of Indian scholars studying China. Similarly, in the thematic panels, the issues covered are both exciting and enlightening, ranging from contemporary social and cultural manifestations to bilateral and multilateral economic interactions to challenges of governance to historical linkages. 
we expect different components of China studies to be reshaped through interdisciplinary research and new niche areas to assume significance and claim scholarly attention. When we started planning in March this year, we had thought we will be holding the 15th AICCS in the historic city of Guwahati, in the serene and beautiful Northeast. A few months down the line, it became clear that uh, we have to opt for the virtual mode. But considering the enormous challenges all of us have faced in the last few years, we are happy and fortunate to be here and looking forward to an exciting and enriching experience in the 15th AICCS. Best wishes and thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, I now invite Professor Sukanya Sharma, Head of Department of Department of Humanities and Social Sciences of Indian Institute of Technology, Guwahati. Over to you, ma'am. Uh, thank you. Uh, very good morning to all of you and a virtual welcome to the 15th AICCS. Indeed, it's a privilege for us to host this uh, prestigious conference. It helps to adapt, to connect, to collaborate and share. Our endeavor here is multidisciplinary as we are nine departments placed under an umbrella term, humanities and social science in IIT Guwahati and in the IIT system. But this provides us an unique opportunity all the time. We are, uh, and we look forward to this uh, deliberations where we are capable of looking at issues, understanding issues from different perspectives and reaching the understandings in a multi-dimensional multi level. This is, we consider this as our strength and this type of conferences, the deliberation of ideas, the meeting of minds of specialists, especially is valuable and important to us. We are grateful that AI CCS considered us uh, and to uh, we were able to at least host it virtually. Yes, the physical interaction is uh, maybe much more valuable, but at the same time, the virtual mode today too is the need of the hour. We can see a wide uh, or a, you know, a range of uh, audience connecting from different parts of the world. Uh, this makes uh, the conference even more lively. Wishing all of you and the, the conference organizers, including me, including Dr. Pahi Saikya, uh, Dr. Shabari Mitra, who has uh, uh, taken all the initiative to organize this and our co-host uh, from the uh, Department of Political Science, Guwahati University and Omiyo Kumar Das Institute of Social Change and Development, Guwahati, uh, a huge uh, a success. And thanks for giving me this opportunity to participate in the inaugural uh, session. Thank you uh, very much. Thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, let me now extend a warm welcome to our keynote speaker, Professor Prasenjit Dwara, Oscar L. Thang Professor at East Asian Studies and Director of Global Asia Initiative, History Department in Duke University, North Carolina. Born and educated in India, Professor Dwara received his PhD in Chinese history from Harvard University. He was previously professor and chair of Department of History and chair of Committee of Chinese Studies at the University of Chicago. Subsequently, he became Raffles Professor at Humanities and Director of Asia Research Institute at National University of Singapore. Some of his noteworthy publications include Culture, Power and State, Rural North China, which won the Fairbank Prize of American Historical Association and Levinson Prize. Amongst his other books are Rescuing History from the Nation, Sovereignty and Authenticity, and most recently, The Crisis of Global Modernity, Asian Traditions and a Sustainable Future. His work has been widely translated into Chinese, Japanese, Korean, and European languages. 
He will talk on China and Southeast Asia, a contemporary history. Over to you, sir. Yeah. Oh, shoot. Uh, just a minute. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, yes, Professor. Okay. Is the volume okay? Yes, the volume is fine and we can see your screen as well. Uh, you can see the screen. I'm sorry, this will have to be a, like a podcast. Uh, this is almost the first time in the three years where we've been suffering through Zoom that this has happened. Both my computers have uh, decided to go off because I was giving a talk in my hometown. Of course, this is not uh, the first time I'm speaking at IIT. I spoke just two, three years ago, and then once before that as well. So I'm very happy to do this. And uh, I'm very sorry that uh, uh, you'll have to uh, <laughs> treat it as a, as a radio show. Well, you have the pictures at least. Okay, so um, I, I also want to thank everybody, but uh, the time is of the essence. So I will just thank the organizers of AICCS in Guwahati and move on. So my topic is China and Southeast Asia, a contemporary history. And um, what I want to do, oh shoot, is this an old one? Is this, uh, is this my PowerPoint? I'm sorry. Uh, Professor like Dwara, old... do you want us to play the PowerPoint for you? No, that's okay. I think it's the same one today. Okay, so uh, I, I, I spent the day making changes, but I can improvise. Uh, the um, So what I want to do is uh, look at Southeast Asia-China relations uh, or through the lens uh, of the Chinese tribute order, but I want to... Uh, not say that Southeast Asia belongs to the Chinese tribute order. Rather, uh, we should see the relationship in the interface. The tribute order is the interface between what I am calling the Southeast Asian mandala order, uh, which is uh, also called by the great anthropologist Stanley Tambaya, uh, is also called the galactic polity. So, uh, I uh, uh, will talk about that in a little bit. So I want to look at those that relationship and I want to see uh, how that relationship has changed today. Now, so I would like to place uh, much less emphasis on territorial states and nations in these relations and look more at cross institutional relations, at networks, at geographies and uh, what I call, I have a particular theory that I'm developing uh, called circulatory histories, which refers not so much to uh, uh, but the contrast, which is uh, the, uh, excuse me, there's some disturbance. I'll just be back in a, in a minute. Please, please hold on. Yes, as I was saying, there is, uh, uh, it's a less uh, emphasis on territorial states and nations uh, and much more on, yes. Professor Prasenjit, uh, sir, I just wanted to uh, tell you that it would be better if you could play the PPT uh, because it's not the whole, the slide is not on the whole screen. F5, oh, okay, sir. you mean, yes, I understand. Unfortunately, yeah, slideshow, yeah. Okay. So from current slide. Yeah, well, that's okay, yeah. So uh, the, um, so I, I call the circulatory histories that do not uh, uh, take the, t the territorial entity of the nation as the, uh, as the subject of history, but more sort of looking at networks, geographies, 
and uh, cross-institutional relations and those kinds of things. Now, we, we all know, especially recently, about the landed silk routes. There are uh, silk routes uh, through Central Asia that go from China all the way to Rome, and of course, also going south uh, uh, to, to South Asia. And there are the uh, maritime silk routes. Uh, now, the maritime is more important for this, for this paper because as uh, many of you know, between uh, the 1300 and 1850 or so, there was the Asian maritime trade, which was uh, which which hugged along the coast. It was more natural and uh, physical and geographical in that it followed the monsoon winds uh, according to the time when the winds would help uh, the um, uh, this uh, view. I'm sorry, is is appearing all the time. So I see everybody who is being admitted. Is there some way that can be removed? <laughs> okay. So um, so these are these are more natural routes that go from uh, from all the way from Aden or in Yemen today to uh, to uh, to China and on to Japan, to Guangzhou, Quanzhou, and on to uh, some parts of Japan in the Kyushu Islands and so on. So and here, of course, you have very important entrepôts. One of the most important was Malacca uh, in the 19th century that shifted to to Singapore. And there were networks of Chinese, Indian, Jewish, and Arab merchants with very sophisticated credit transfer mechanisms that conducted this kind of uh, for, uh, trade in the Indian Ocean. Now, this, of course, went on. And during the period of high imperialism in the 19th and 20th century, it was intensified. Uh, and then uh, during the Cold War, there was a hiatus when trade sort of in this region, this maritime trade, um, uh, uh, declined uh, because it was much more um, uh, based on um, uh, much more attentive to national development. Uh, since then, of course, Network Asia has picked up again, and um, uh, and this is what uh, I will talk about towards the end of my okay. Um, let me move on. Here is uh, 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 just a picture to tell you what I meant by the natural uh, patterns. These are the monsoon winds. The maritime route is uh, going from um, the northeast monsoons. Uh, that is when the Arab traders, Indian traders, and so on, uh, uh, and Baghdadi Jewish traders, of course, are very important, and go through uh, the uh, uh, the straits uh, in, in uh, Malacca is here, as you'll see just at this point. Uh, is my cursor showing? I guess, I hope. Uh, this yes, is... sir. Yes, sir. Okay, good. Yes, sir. So it's, uh, so this, it often has to go through these, uh, uh, these, uh, these straits to reach this, uh, this area. And this Malacca here is a kind of a kind of a choke point. Or, I mean, it's, it's the entrepôt, of course. This is where, in fact, uh, the winds, not all the traders went all the way to China. At different times, they would the winds would take them, the monsoon winds would take them to Malacca, where they would wait for Chinese traders to come from the other north, uh, northeast uh, uh, monsoons and uh, exchange goods and go back again following the monsoon. And this... Uh, uh, but uh, but because precisely Malacca was such an important entrepot, and it's also a very narrow uh, region here, it was uh, something that uh, I think it was Pierre Gomez, the Portuguese uh, 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 sojourner in the in the 16th century, who said that whoever controls uh, Malacca controls the throat of this trade. And uh, so this became very important. And of course, the British, uh, clever as they were, uh, resituated it into Singapore and continued. Of course, uh, the Malacca was also controlled by the Portuguese, the Dutch, and then the British, who then moved it to Singapore once they exchanged that uh, with the Dutch, uh, Ben Cullen with the Dutch. Okay, so to move on here, um, I can't even see. Okay. 
So uh, I'm not going to spend too much time on this. Uh, this is part of another paper, but uh, this is what I talk about circulatory histories, where uh, it's not circulatory doesn't mean that you come back to the same point that you know, it's uh, merely cyclical, but things change from place to place, but they do have a connection with where they came from uh, or, or where they came from immediately, right? And we can see this all the time because events disperse beyond time and space, beyond the original purpose. A war can have uh, very distant effects on prices or on power structure. I often give the case of Marxism in China and how it came in through many different sources, as you know, from, uh, from France, from uh, Japan, and then ultimately from Russia and uh, uh, from the Soviet Union. And, uh, and it, it was transformed in China into a peasant revolution, which is, of course, completely the opposite of what Marx expected. Uh, and, uh, and then when it goes out of China, uh, today we see that although it went out as a peasant rebellion, but now if you look at where most of the... Uh, most of the uh, the, uh, the the Maoist movements are they are in tribal regions, whether it's in Latin America with the Chiapas and, and other uh, um, American Indian uh, movements, or, or in South Asia and so on. And of course, there are very interesting reasons for this, but they do it does circulate, change, and sometimes it comes back also in an unrecognizable kind of way. And networks, I believe, are very important carriers of these kinds of, of circulatory history. Mm -hmm. They are intersecting and they are uh, rhizomatic in, in the sense that they send roots out, R-O-O-T-S along R-O-U-T-E-S. So, uh, so they're much better than uh, bounded and tunneled histories. Now, to come to the issue of what... Uh, we call uh, galactic polities or what Tambaya calls the Mandala model. This is um, uh, one which is based on the idea of a core and uh, a satellite, right? So you have here, yeah, you have all these Southeast Asian empires mm -hmm. and uh, you can see here, this is the core areas and uh, you have these satellites who are often very much micro models but at the same time, they, because they're based on cosmologically the same principle, which is that the, the monarch or the king who or the leader who occupies the center has some kind of, derives some kind of sacred authority. And so, and so the others have to sort of uh, work with that. And the, 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 this authority sort of uh, radiates out, losing sort of the further out it goes, the less uh, uh, powerful it uh, becomes. So what we have here, this is a good example. I hope you can see it. My, uh, yeah, uh, this is a good example of the Ayutthaya polity that Tamba himself talks about, where you have the core regions are one and uh, you know, the two regions are the ones which are closest to the monarch. Uh, so the vassals or the, the sons, the princes often, three are less close and uh, four are further out. Uh, although you also notice here that most of these South Asian empires are actually close to waterways, to mouths of rivers, or to uh, the oceanic mode. And this is because precisely because they took advantage of these trading networks. And, uh, and this is a very good example of this. And you notice that also these, these little princelings, I guess, who are number four around the, what we now call the Bangkok area in Ayutthaya uh, are actually um, uh, much uh, uh, are less controllable uh, by the by the monarch at the center, and uh, that's probably because they have a lot of power based on trade. But I'm not a hundred percent sure of that. It's just uh, 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 my my guess from the map. Now we look at, as I said, the imperial Chinese model uh, is is sort of not entirely different from this. Uh, 
Mandala model. You also have, ideologically at least, you have a center which radiates out, uh, but it, there are significant differences in that the center also civilizes those at the edge, those who come in. But of course, the biggest difference is that China is a bureaucratic empire, right? And um, while internally it is a bureaucratic empire, uh, towards the, its outer, uh, uh, towards the communities and polities outside uh, its territorial empire, and this includes in, uh, most importantly the Northwest with Mongols and various different uh, groups, um, including the uh, Turkish and the Tibetans and then the Manchus at certain point before they became rulers. Uh, they had certain relationships with them and with the Southeast Asian states, which is was thought of right from the 1960s uh, American scholarship as being part of the Chinese tribute order. Now we're beginning to see that, that in fact, this relationship was not so much at, at at a superficial level, it was dictated by the imperial center in China. But in fact, there were uh, the different polities used it for their own purposes, right? So it was not a form of uh, domination that we see in later centuries uh, with uh, imperialism and, uh, and still later. It was uh, a much more sort of, although theoretically, uh, all these tribute paying uh, polities and their chieftains and kings and so on had to provide, uh, had to give tribute and had to um, accept the superiority of the Chinese emperor. You had to go and knock your head three times. This is uh, on the on the floor to, uh, this is known as the, uh, the, the kowtow or the kato, which is to hit your head, uh, to knock it and uh, your head on the floor. Uh, this is actually was was just a, a, a ritual activity, one might say, uh, with certain significances. But increasingly, uh, this was uh, uh, a very complex, what we would think not of as an order or a system, but a kind of a language game, right? So that you had different people with different interests and variations and so on with the, within their own political systems or their own political orders, which were very different. So it wasn't a system. It was one where there wasn't a single principle or doctrine, say, of sovereignty, which tied all this together. They were much more open-ended, right, with uh, changing roles and uh, diverse and changing roles for different players. So there was... Uh, um, so, for instance, we see that when the Manchu emperor however, had to deal with the Tibetans, with the Dalai Lama, uh, they, it wasn't exactly a case of uh, the Dalai Lama uh, kowtowing to the Chinese emperor. Rather, he, the Chinese emperor came down halfway to meet the Dalai Lama because the Dalai Lama was, uh, because the emperor was also Buddhist, uh, including everything else, son of heaven and so on. Those days you could have all these different uh, identifications. And uh, the Dalai Lama was considered a mentor, right, uh, to the uh, to the Chinese emperor. Now, so this kind of flexibility that we see permitted advantages to various parties in terms of economic interests as well as political rhetoric, right? Politically, the imperial state needed to legitimate its institutional structures domestically by using the cosmological re uh, rhetoric of rule over the uh, universal realm. Now, with, the, with Southeast Asia, uh, the Chinese tribute order represents the an interface with the Mandala order, uh, with the, the Mandala order having its own internal logic and goal, right? So, for instance, we see here, we had seen the maps of Srivijaya and uh, Majapahit, uh, who were very powerful uh, kingdoms, maritime kingdoms in, uh, let's go back to show you, here is Srivijaya which was uh, dominant from 7th to the 12th century. And here is Majapahit in the region of Java today, 
which then takes over uh, this the control of this region. And uh, to go back to what we were talking about is that uh, they often use the East Asian tribute because they accept the, the so-called superiority of the Chinese emperor, but uh, they often use this to maintain their own order, saying that they had the, uh, the imprimatur of the Chinese emperor. And uh, they were uh, able to use it against, uh, uh, against you know, other uh, forces that became powerful in the region and around them. So they were able to use this quite well. One of the most interesting sort of cases was how uh, very often they would also uh, uh, make use of it as a device. So for instance, Srivijaya used their Chinese tributary status at as gatekeepers to keep out other competitors uh, for, uh, for Chinese trade. And one of the most important competitors and a very powerful uh, kingdom was the Chola kingdom in South India. The Chola, uh, in fact, then went on to, uh, to because they, they uh, uh, persuaded the Chinese emperor that the Cholas were, um, uh, in the Sung, the Sung Emperor, that the Cholas were just as uh, not a very important group, and we can represent them, and so they effectively denied uh, Chola access to the kind of trade, particularly because they were able to also control the uh, the the region around Malacca, the straits there. So here, this is where Majapahit is. We we don't have it here. I mean, Srivijaya is around here. And you see here, uh, these are this is the Chola kingdom, and there is an uh, in the the Cholas use both. Some people say that they went up uh, uh, up the coast here and down all the way to occupy uh, the Srivijayan capital for uh, two years and teach them a lesson, as it were. And so this was uh, regarded as the great Chola conquest uh, in Southeast Asia. Of course, they went back. They were not uh, able to keep it or they did not want to keep it for, for any great length of time. But, uh, but this uh, was certainly something that, uh, and they renewed their trade with the, uh, with the Chinese imperial system. Uh, so, so you could see how uh, these Southeast Asian uh, uh, polities and kingdoms and empires even were able to uh, use the, uh, the Chinese order for their own purposes. Now, one of the reasons that the, that the Chinese um, um, uh, tribute order became so popular and so important uh, was and, and drew so many groups to them was because it became increasingly about trade. But trade was always part of it because while, uh, while ritually the idea was that the tributary would pay some tribute and whatever goods they had, whether you had special kinds of um, uh, exotic minerals or gems or uh, animals was also very uh, uh, important in these kinds of trade and or precious goods or manufactures even, or ships. If you presented that to the, as tribute to the emperor, the emperor returns you a more valuable gift very often, or at least an equivalent amount. So, but then the emperor also gives you something else. The emperor gives you a kind of a license to trade within a certain region, right? And this becomes more as China becomes more and more economically uh, powerful over the last millennium, especially after uh, the 13th, 12th, uh, the 10th century, if not before, uh, in the maritime region and so on. Uh, this this license to trade becomes very important. It kind of reminds you of what has started happening recently when uh, the uh, when an American president or the Indian prime minister goes to visit uh, um, another country. Uh, there's a delegation of businessmen that go to to sort of set up uh, uh, business exchanges and economic relations and so on. So that kind of thing was very important, the license to trade. 
And, you know, occasionally, uh, one of the interesting things is that during the Song, the Song dynasty, uh, which is from the, uh, the, especially the Southern Song, from the 10th to the 12th, actually the Northern Song, uh, also uh, had to pay tribute to the, the Mongols, the Khitan and the Tangut to the north, uh, because they had been lost their, their wars to them. But even as they paid tribute, actually, uh, they gained a lot economically because then they were able to trade their bolts of silk and other uh, important Chinese goods for which there was a great demand in these Mongol regions and so on. So, in fact, they ended up making more money uh, even through defeat. So, but by the 16th century, the entire tribute trade zone becomes uh, loosely integrated through the use of silver. And for those of you who are not familiar with global history, the silver, of course, is coming from the New World, from the Americas, from uh, South America in particular, Mexico and uh, Potosi, I think, in Bol Bolivia, uh, which, of course, uh, the Portuguese, uh, which the Spaniards uh, completely exhausted, as well as having exhausted the people there. Uh, they also use slaves for this. Uh, but this silver, a lot of it ended up a lot of it ended up in Mughal India, but a lot of it, but the bulk of it, especially through going, coming through the Pacific in, in the, the Manila galleons, ended up in China. And this then sort of led to a great intensification of trade and um, the economic opportunities were for a long time sufficient to keep all of those involved, including the Europeans, the East India Company and others, uh, vested in the tributary mode, right? They too accepted the tributary order. They accepted the ritual sovereignty of the Chinese emperor or supremacy of the Chinese emperor. Now, I I don't want to say that there was no violence, military violence involved in this uh, in this kind of interface trade and ritual relationships, but uh, there was military violence. Uh, the Ming naval, the most famous of which, which were the Admiral Chang'e uh, expeditions, which I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with. Um, and uh, what is now shown is that it wasn't just uh, a win-win uh, expedition. It was uh, uh, the Chang'e uh, galleons uh, captured slaves and even a king from Sri Lanka uh, in a bid to demonstrate the power of the Chinese emperor. But the point is, and they often they also established garrisons and a colony in Malacca, uh, and and had sufficiently weakened the Majapahit who controlled Malacca at that point, until of course it was taken over by the Portuguese. Uh, so there was that. But the principle, and these are the Chang'e expeditions. For those of you who are not familiar, uh, they come out of different parts of. Uh, well, the main capital is Nanjing, and then these are the different routes. There were, I think, seven of them in the early 15th century, right? So, and then they were discontinued because they were very expensive, and uh, the Chinese had other problems in the north, uh, which uh, for which they needed the resources. So, um, so, but to say, to talk to continue about military power because I think this is very important also for the contemporary period. Such military authority over the sea route uh, that Chang'e established was not maintained beyond a brief window. There was no control over the land route either. The nomads in Central Asia controlled routes after the Mongols. So the military was significant principally in managing border states who often harassed and threatened the tribute trade at its periphery, right? So one could say that tribute was a mode of seeking an equilibrium in border relations and costly expeditions were undertaken largely as punitive and stabilizing measures with mixed results. I mean, you know, there had been, of course, lots of raids from the north and northwest and the Koreans at one point were also great raiders. But uh, by the late Qing uh, in the uh, 18th century and so on, it was the Burmese, the uh, the expansionist Kongbang uh, dynasty that would uh, uh, would raid and often defeat the Chinese, uh, uh, though, of course, they, they agreed to a 
a peace peace arrangement, if not treaty, at at one point. So arguably, the flexibility of the tribute order enabled the interlacing of cultural and economic goals for the various players without significant use of military violence. Now, can the current Chinese order and the Belt and Road Initiative reproduce such a win-win condition? Is it possible to convey a sense of fair exchange of providing desirable goods and values without the threat of overwhelming military and financial power? That is what people call soft power. Of course, there are the new conditions of capitalism, nationalism, statism, which changes things a great deal. But there are also, I think, uh, many continuities, if not because of the tribute order, maybe socialism also had uh, plays a role and also the current conditions. So let's try to see. Now, oh, I can't even see. Uh, excuse me. Yeah. Tribute and uh, military power. We have done that. You see my. So, okay. China and Southeast Asia in the 20th century. So we're doing a big jump, right? China's goals in Southeast Asia were pretty consistent since the late Qing, uh, which was to re restore its right, rightful status as a global power and influence in its old tribute zone. There was also a large ethnic Chinese population in Southeast Asia, which was wealthy already by the early 20th century and influential and willing to assist the Chinese government. Now, during the early People's Republic of China, this was the only zone of influence that it could really have in Asia. And it sought to create uh, its foundation as a regional power by having uh, this as a zone of its influence. Even during the Mao era, except during the Cultural Revolution, China had a complex strategy of both in Southeast Asia of both maintaining state to state relations and giving revolutionary support, although this was not, uh, uh, it was limited sometimes. So it was always playing on these two legs. After 1980, uh, with the Kaifang, uh, the, there, was an, uh, there was an abandoning of national claims on the ethnic Chinese to give up, and they also gave up support of the communists, uh, who, as we know, in Southeast Asia, were often Chinese, or a very large proportion of them were. Thus, the PRC also minimized ethnic tensions with Chinese within Southeast Asia, and then increasing numbers of Chinese students and so on uh, began to go to Southeast Asia, and there was much more relationship. Uh, the real engagement with Southeast Asia and especially with ASEAN, which uh, had started as a security, Cold War security arrangement, multilateral arrangement, but transformed by the 1990s uh, uh, into an, an economic uh, and uh, security and economic sort of uh, relationship and interdependence and a, a region, uh, a multilateral region of um, um, seeking to integrate the region. Uh, so one of the most important roles that China plays in Southeast Asia is, is during the Asian financial crisis, when it did not devalue its currency. And it offered limited because if it done so, then the, the, the you know, Southeast Asian goods would have been even less, uh, had uh, less marketable possibilities. So uh, it didn't do that. And it came to it offered limited assistance when the West ignored this region. So there had been some goodwill that had been established uh, over the last, uh, over those, the first, um, over, over the, uh, the second half of the 20th century, one can say. Uh, China is also able to utilize the regional context to both balance its bilateral relationship with Japan and the U.S. and to serve as a foundation for its international status. Now, region formation, I, I don't want to go into this in great detail, so I'll just say that Southeast Asia had developed into a kind of a, into a region. Uh, region formation, of course, develops very strongly after the Cold War uh, ended. So you have, of course, Europe is the most uh, recognizable case of an 
of a political economic region. You have NAF you had NAFTA, you have Mercosur in South uh, South America, and then you have Asia. Now, regions do allow for economies of scale and competitiveness. This is why they get together because of big players like the United States and China. Uh, but regions are also important because they're an intermediate stage and uh, between globalization and national modes of resolving issues. They're important because while globalization can produce wealth, it also produces stratification and overconsumption of resources. Regions permit smaller clusterings of sovereign or semi-sovereign agencies to tackle the spill-out problems which cross national boundaries. And uh, we saw from the 1990s, the 10 ASEAN countries, their economic integration grows uh, not only within themselves, for instance, uh, the amount of trade, inter, inter intra-Asian trade that was going on before 1990s uh, was only about 33%. After, by the time of the, soon after the financial crisis, this went up to well over 50%. And now it's probably closer to 70, 75%. So you can see that there is a, a kind of a, uh, interdependence that's going on uh, not only within ASEAN, but uh, with certain neighboring countries. Of course, now the most important trading partner is China, uh, though Japan is not uh, far behind. And in fact, Japan has a much greater investments in Southeast Asia, even though people don't sort of recognize it, about twice as much uh, or three times as much as China. Uh, now, so this kind of integration takes place basically through supply chains and so on, which are of course now being reorganized. But so for instance, a Chinese product can be made with Japanese capital, Korean technology, Taiwanese hardware, and you have uh, you know Southeast Asia uh, as consumers or uh, other uh, providers of other services and so on in there. Uh, also, there was much more sort of, you know, the cultural connections, the Korean wave and so on becomes very important as an integrator. And uh, But it's not only about economic integration. Uh, ASEAN was needed to coordinate common and linked problems of regional public goods or the commons. So issues like climate change, public health, environment, these needed to transcend national interests in order to continue just to have the nation, right? Um, now, one of the interesting things that we saw, especially in the first decade of the 21st century, uh, is that ASEAN had tried to create a kind of regional interdependency and also this idea of enmeshing other powers, right? Enmeshing through commercial dis, uh, diplomacy. It sought to tie down the powers and benefit materially by treaties and FTAs with long term goals of integration. So you have ASEAN plus three, which is China, Japan, Korea. You have uh, East Asia, uh, uh, what is it? EAS, which also includes countries like India. Then you have RCEP, which does not include India. Now, apart from the FTA with China, Japan, and others, they have succeeded in getting all the powers to accept ASEAN's core principles in what is known as the Treaty of Amity and Cooperation, or ASEAN TAC. And China was one of the first to, to sign this treaty of, although now we know that it's slightly, it doesn't fully accept this. Uh, the, one of the interesting things about this enmeshment was that no power could easily afford to ignore or upset this web of interdependencies at the core of which was ASEAN, right? So in a way, they had been creating the conditions for uh, Asian uh, uh, integration and interconnections. And of course, it's not at all like the European Union. These are, it's a much looser connection, but these, this enmeshment principle is very interesting, I think. Uh, it resembles because these are, you know, the European 
a union is more like a supra nation state. These are very much individual nation states which come together for certain purposes. Some people argue mainly for hedging purposes, but uh, there's also a great deal of uh, commonality that links them now, especially through their different activities in the environment and other realms. And so they're a little more like the uh, uh, Asian trade networks that we saw, the maritime trade networks that we saw in earlier centuries, right? Uh, because of the separation of political, economic, and military levels and power here. Since 2009, uh, the tensions, uh, with the tensions in the South China Sea, with island building and so on by China, and China declaring its, its rights over the, the Nine Dash Line and so on, and China occasionally denying the rights of smaller countries to the seas, this, this has led to uh, a fair number of tensions. And it signaled very much challenges to ASEAN unity and to the whole architecture that was being divided. And now we know that ASEAN is in many ways divided. Uh, also, China prefers bilateralism rather than dealing with the entity as a whole. So... Southeast Asia, the countries and the ASEAN countries begin to lose confidence in the idea, of course, of a peaceful rise of China. Now, one of the things, I don't have much time, I know, but <laughs> can I have, uh, what, maybe 10 minutes more? Is that too much? So Try we and do have exactly five. 10 minutes. Okay, good. Okay. okay. I should definitely be able to finish by then. Okay, so um, less conspicuous than the problems in the South China Sea, but probably more damaging to the hinterland of Southeast Asia is the Chinese construction of gargantuan dams on the Mekong and Salween rivers, as well as we know on the Brahmaputra in the Himalayas, although you know much of the waters uh, of the Brahmaputra does come from within the Indian borders, um, within the disputed Indian borders, but it does. Uh, but it is really at this point in the Mekong and Salween with these uh, great plans, you know, we uh, I, I can't go into that in detail. I just want to touch on it uh, because you see that uh, this kind of, uh, this whole region and in fact, East, Southeast, and South Asia are all physically interconnected, especially through rivers. The Himalayas has watersheds for 10 major Asian rivers. Close to 2 billion people are dependent on it. And 60 million of them live in Southeast Asia, right? This is the rivers emanating from the Tibetan Plateau or from the Circum Himalayan region. Uh, now, dam building on the Mekong, Salween have major negative effects on the livelihoods of thousands of communities. And, uh, you know, as it is, uh, the UN, uh, I, this is an old report, I have a much newer one, uh, report, IPCC report says that, you know, vast tropical coastlines and coastal mega cities, Asia is one of the world's regions most vulnerable to global warming. Tens of millions of people are likely to lose their home as flooding, famine and rising sea levels sweep the region. Much like in Bangladesh, there is, uh, and parts of Eastern India, uh, the Mekong is subsiding rapidly, partly and in significant part because uh, uh, of the uh, sedimentation change and the limitation of sedimentation that used to sort of fill up the Mekong Delta. Now that Mekong Delta is going to be underwater in much less time than we think. Uh, as as are so many other parts because of one of the main reasons being uh, dam building and sediment change, uh, along with, of course, uh, change in fishery level, water level, loss of livelihoods of people having to move around. So, in fact, we actually see in Southeast Asia the, both the Mekong and Salween activism and Chinese uh, in Yunnan in, in Southeast Asia had in the first decade of the uh, 21st century, enormous numbers of NGOs uh, and uh, environmental NGOs that uh, joined with these movements to protest these dams, and they were quite successful till 2012, 2013. Uh, but now these dams have been activated again. And so there had always often been a fair amount of activism. So here is a, a quick map uh, which shows you 
the different rivers that emanate from the Tibetan plateau. It doesn't show you so much uh, the uh, the emanation of the Indian rivers, but shows you the Brahmaputra and the Indus, South Asian uh, rivers. So uh, you see that the glacial melting, river diversions, dam building are endangering the sources and livelihoods of hundreds of millions. And so inter and uh, here are the uh, the dams that were planned. Some of them have been changed and so on, but there's still a very large number of dams. And these are gargantuan dams. If you think the Three Gorges is the biggest dam, some of these are much bigger. So, um, so you do have these. And I should also say, it's not just the Chinese, it's often in collaboration with Southeast Asian countries, including Thailand and Laos and so on, that uh, and Vietnam. Uh, as well as we know, in India also, there are uh, many uh, who uh, wish to create these kinds of gigantic dams. Uh, so there has been a, a fair amount of um, transborder activism, the Mekong Salvin watersheds. There has been, uh, you know, this, uh, the, the, um, you have uh, the civil society organizations which emerged in those democratic parts of uh, uh, Southeast Asia, including places like Vietnam and, and Cambodia and so on, which are not very democratic, but nonetheless, they're big civil society movements, which until recently were in fact <clears throat> and Myanmar, you had the mid uh uh, episode which canceled, led to the cancellation of a dam building and so on. So you have uh, these groups, the Mekong mainstream dam groups, people's voices across the borders who act as watchdogs and pressure groups uh, to limit the the role of, uh, to limit dam building. And uh, I had done a fair amount of work and this is a group in uh, Cambodia called the Avatars uh, after, of course, uh, this is a they they sought to to protect their prelang forests, and they used to demonstrate uh, all the time in front of the Cambodian, uh, you know, their big square, the the in the capital. Um, every weekend, they would come from down from the hills and and protest against uh, deforestation and also. Uh, 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 riverine transformations and things like that. And there's many groups in Cambodia that did it, but they clicked once they started depicting themselves like the uh, so-called um, uh, Nabi people in the Avatar movie. And they became, in fact, I heard of them and saw them uh, only uh, after they were reported in the newspapers, 10 years after they had started their movement in 2011, which was just after the movie Avatar came out as well. And they depicted themselves and they caught the attention of all the youth and the groups and scientists and NGOs and so on, in, not only in Cambodia, but in the region and globally. And the, their movement turned out to be quite successful. Now they, in fact, protect their own forests and so on. I actually went to meet with them. This is also the cover of my book, which has exactly, I met with, this is me, by the way, with the little bald head here. Uh, and I met with several of them and they were talking about their, their achievement, but also their struggles. They said it was great that the youth and the NGOs and so on came to join our cause. But after a while, we found out that they were, there was too much uh, internal squabbling about them. So we said, OK, we'll take what you have to give us, but leave us alone. We can protect our own forests. <laughs> so that was an interesting sort of, uh, uh, you know, something I learned at the at the conference uh, that we held in Phnom Penh. Uh, here are some other movements is the Mitzvah, and this is done very much in Yunnan as well, right? Uh, not imaginable now, but in the 2000s, it was something that could happen, uh, that did happen frequently. And here are some of the, the very important leaders in Yunnan. Okay. Now, the, so the rise of China and so on has uh, greatly exacerbated ASEAN integration issues. Uh, you know, there are some Chinese allies, Laos, Cambodia, and they're middle of roaders, they're independence, and uh, the state-to-state -state relationship has been weakened. Of course, Trump made it much worse. Now, uh, 
But what has happened, I think I'm going to, uh, is that, of course, now uh, Belt and Road Initiative has been uh, replaced with, or not replaced, has been, is not, especially after these recent events we see and the Bali G20 conference, we see that it's not so much Belt and Road that's being talked about as much as Global Development Initiative, the GDI, right? And uh, that is, so what has happened is that the Belt and Road Initiative has, while it has been very uh, uh, valuable for many countries which do not get investments in their infrastructure and so on, uh, uh, it has also had problems. So for instance, the main benefits of the BRI for Southeast Asia and many other parts of the world was infrastructural capital and digital logistics uh, and, uh, and so on. But then the problems are that it meets with resistance it leads to certain debt, although I don't believe in debt trap idea. Nonetheless, there are certain ways in which actually the debt trap is just as much for the Chinese as it is for the those uh, countries who suddenly suffer, like Sri Lanka is suffering, not only because China is only uh, about, uh, I think, less than uh, or just about 10% of the debt. But in Africa, China has 30% of the debt uh, is owed to China uh, overall, and some countries are much more. Uh, but the, the problem is that what do you do to a debtor country now? You It's not that easy to take over another country or anything. You know, Greece uh, or the Euro Europeans had to take lots of haircuts with Greece and so on. So this is an era when, in fact, the creditor uh, has problems with indebtedness as well. So I don't think that's the issue. But nonetheless, the way it has worked, I mean, the Chinese don't want to lose money, uh, that they are beginning to lose money. And in these projects, some of which for various reasons, and uh, and this is uh, not something that's very viable. In fact, uh, in 2021, Xi Jinping himself sort of said that, you know, it's time for others to now start uh, investing in private companies and so on, uh, instead of the Chinese state in Africa. He said that about Africa. But uh, we see that, uh, so this is, this is, uh, debt is not, the two problems that we have seen uh, greatly is environment and what I would call a new form of power, which is virtual power or digital power, right? The environment is a problem. And the, the reason for that is that the Chinese are very, um, what should I say, uh, not Westphalian, but maybe Panchashilan in dealing between uh, states, uh, between constituted states. So if that country, if it deals with a country where civil society is not well developed, then in fact, uh, it will deal with the states and maybe with crony capitalists and so on, and uh, and which could not be very interested in what happens to the environment. Uh, but uh, where there is a civil society activist, the Chinese actually respond to some extent, just as they've been doing to some extent in the Mekong as well, although the dams are still being built, but... Uh, this is a, a kind of an issue. But digital control, I mean, we can talk about this at great length. We don't, I just wanted to mention it. Digital control, however, is a, um, is a very important kind of factor because, in fact, nowadays uh, you have in its infrastructure a building, it also includes digital control, whether it's through the China, as you know, has is most developed in artificial intelligence and 5G in its GPS system, including militarized uh, 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 in, uh, uh, GPS systems that um, it so far, I believe, is only given to Pakistan. And I don't know that the Pakistans have the wherewithal to use it. But uh, this... Uh, these digital systems can be tracked. You know, they are on uh, platforms with uh, which are code, which have codes and protocols that are controlled uh, by the Chinese systems. And uh, so, you know, you're always they can always be weaponized as well as but they, they what they call dual use uh, technologies very often. And so, this is a new form of power that. Uh, that we have not been familiar with and which the Chinese have been very advanced in. So that's a kind of a, 
uh, a problematic uh, issue. The other, of course, is surveillance technology. And, uh, and this is for me one of the most important things because when you sell this kind of surveillance technologies to other authoritarian or even democratic uh, regimes, you can it can suppress civil society much more easily than uh, than other things. Of course, I think uh, Google and all can also do that, but uh, here is something with uh, state power uh, that uh, can control. So, so that is a bit of uh, an issue, I think. Since the there are two things, I, this is going to be my last slide, and it has nothing. Um, you know, uh, it's an old slide, so I, I'm sort of, I don't have my present one, so I'm just going to talk uh, uh, without sort of looking sufficiently at that. Now, but the uh, Beijing seems to be listening to all these problems, and it is pulling back. Partly, it is pulling back in many areas, for instance, uh, on the Mekong, uh, it could, uh, uh, just, uh, well, Actually, actually, this is the right one slide. Since April 29 BRI summit, there is talk of more transparency and engagement with different parties and more stakeholders, so that you know it it it's uh, sort of transparency issues. It's still not transparent, but that is the issue that's being brought up. Perhaps over over. 20% uh, of the pro projects are being negotiated or cancelled and probably gone up much higher since COVID, especially not so much in Southeast Asia as well, but much more in Africa, I think. Uh, but it could do it in renegotiations. For instance, there is a scheme of called uh, debt for nature. And if China is willing to agree to uh, remitting or renegotiating some of this, it can it can uh, employ this kind of global environmental facility, which is debt for nature, where the borrower country debt is forgiven in exchange for the country's uh, uh, commitment to fund key environmental objectives such as tropical forest preservation and things like that. So, it could sort of still develop in a way to address this environmental issue and uh, uh, create a kind of a win-win situation. Of course, there are many countries that are doubtful about this, but one of the most interesting things that has happened uh, since uh, the coming of uh, President Biden to power is, of course, the turning of attention to back to Southeast Asia of Western countries, of the global North, including countries like Japan and, and um, uh, Australia and so on. You have the Quad, of course, we all know about the Quad in India, but you have this Indo-Pacific economic framework and so on, much of which is designed also to deal with, uh, to, to win back uh, Southeast Asia in some ways, or at least to provide an alternative to Southeast Asia, which has become increasingly uh, uh, connected to China through investments and infrastructural projects and so on. So in a way, uh, we are back to the enmeshment mode that seemed to have been eroded, at least for the time being, because uh, even just in the Bali uh, a summit just a few days ago, uh, we see this commitment of uh, large uh, amounts of investment. You know, already Japan has, as I said, has over uh, $300 uh, billion of investment in uh, in Southeast Asia, a lot of it in infrastructure, but even the Europeans are coming in with uh, renewable energy and so on. So this Indo-Pacific economic framework is much more about, it seems, less about direct investment than about uh, humanitarian and public goods services. So, and uh, hopefully a lot of green technology can be transferred. So at any rate, from the point of view of uh, Southeast Asia, and also Xi Jinping has committed to now uh, uh, the investments in renewables. And of course, one of the biggest renewable projects probably in the world is the solar plant in, in Pakistan, the Khair de Azam uh, solar plant. So it has been doing some of this, but still the bulk of its investments are in fossil fuel. And if it can sort of control that, and of course we know that it needs to sort of export its own uh, uh, needs um, 
so i mean uh, uh, because it lacks uh, resources within the country because of all kinds of soil um, uh, spoilation and uh, water contamination and so on it has to get resources from outside but if it can do that in a in a sustainable way that could be a win-win for all but we have to be also aware of new forms of power so i'll just leave it at that Thank you. Uh, and I'm sorry that uh, it was a little bit that my lecture was, uh, since especially I couldn't see people, <laughs> I wasn't able to address it uh, with sufficient coherence. But uh, thank you. I apologize, but thank you for listening patiently so far. Okay, bye. Uh, thank you so much, Professor Dwara, for your keynote address. Uh, yeah. I would just like to remind the participants that we won't be having a question and answer round due to no. paucity of time. Uh, I will not, uh, I will now invite Professor Pahi Sakya, co-convener of 15th AICCS and associate professor of political science at Indian Institute of Technology, Guwahati, to deliver the vote of thanks. Over to you, ma'am. Thank you, Zuganda. A very good morning to you all. Uh, it is and need an honor and a privilege to extend the vote of thanks today. Ladies and gentlemen, as we know that uh, the 15th AICCS is such an event, which is the outcome of constant support and close collaboration of several institutions present here today. It is my pleasure to thank each and every individual associated with the Institute of Chinese Studies, Indian Institute of Technology, Guwahati, Guwahati University, Omiyo Kumar Das Institute of Social Change and Development, and Conrad Adnyo Stiftung, New Delhi, for taking active part in organizing this year's 15th AICCS conference. Our sincere gratitude to Professor Prasenji Dwara, our keynote speaker today, for such a wonderful lecture. We'd have been very happy to have an interactive session, but due to paucity of time, this could not happen. On behalf of the organizers, we would also like to thank Adrian Heck, Director Conrad Adenir Stiftung, New Delhi, Professor T.G. Sitaram, Director IIT Guwahati, and Professor Sukanya Sharma, for their immense support in organizing the event. On behalf of the host institution, IIT Guwahati, our partners, Department of Political Science, Guwahati University, and Omiyo Kumar Das Institute of Social Change Development, we highly appreciate the involvement and leadership of the Institute of Chinese Studies in organizing this conference. I express Special words of appreciation to Professor Sabari Mitra, Professor Alka Acharya, Ambassador Ashok Kanta, Dr. Nirja Nair, uh, the core committee members of ICS, staff members, and each and everyone associated with ICS. Rija Nair, you have been a, 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 of great help and you have done a great job. And I must admit that the kind of coordination skills that you have shown over the past few months are, are uh, immensely incredible. Thank you, Rija, for being there. I also take the opportunity to thank Professor Joint Krishna, Krishna Sharma, head of the Department of Political Science, Guwahati University, Akhil Ranjan Datta, Professor in the Department of Political Science, Guwahati University, Dr. Joanna Mezabin, Assistant Professor, Department of Political Science, Guwahati University, for cooperation at every step in terms of organizing this event. We'd like to thank Dr. Shashwati Chaudhary from OKD for joining us. I'd also like to personally thank my colleagues from IIT Guwahati, Dr. Mithilesh Kumar Jha and Dr. Bodhisattva Sengupta for being there. Last but not the least, I'd like to take the opportunity to thank a very dedicated team of reporters, our technical team and our volunteers from all the organizing institutions. Without Without your commitment, this event would not have been possible. I would like to especially thank all our distinguished guests, chairs, discussants, scholars, and participants today. And I sincerely hope that the three days of the virtual conference would allow us the scope to exchange new ideas and novel partnerships 
in the coming future. With these few words, I'd like to thank you once again for joining us today. Have a good day. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, let me conclude the inaugural session by thanking our esteemed panelists, Professor Prasenji Dwara, Professor Alkacharya, Mr. Adrian Haak, Professor T.G. Sitaram, Professor Shabri Mitra, Professor Sukanya Sharma, and Professor Pahi Sakya for joining us. The video recordings of all our sessions will be available on ICS YouTube channel. Uh, we shall now take a short break and resume at 11.25 for our special panel on the topic State of China Studies in India. Please note that you could use the same meeting link to join all our sessions. Thank you very much for joining us in the inaugural session. <laughs>